um, where um, I think some of you might need to consent to being recorded. Um, if anybody, I would also put it out there that uh, you've got our contact details. If anybody has any ideas for future speakers, future themes that you'd like to see us covered. We've had some extraordinarily interesting um, speakers in the last few months covering things. Last month was um, uh, NFTs. Um, and I think they these have been really valuable to the community just to get some experts in to talk about uh, new developments and what's happening with old developments as well. So I would encourage you to contact us and let us know. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Veronica and let her tell us about the state of DAO infrastructure. <laughs> All right, great. Um, thanks so much. I'm very excited to be here. And of course, we are going to be talking about DAOs today. Um, so without further ado, um, yeah, I'm Veronica. I've been a, a full-time Solidity Dev developer for the past uh, three years. I've built dozens of projects, some of the, the bigger ones only launching now, but they take their time. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be able to work on projects end to end, you know, so from designing the smart contracts, building them, deploying them, getting, uh, getting them audited, the, the whole cycle, which has been um, really incredible. So today we're going to be talking about DAOs, right? And uh, I got very excited to just jump straight into the this current state of DAO infrastructure, but I realized I might need to start with the basics, you know, so we're going to start with what are DAOs? Um, right, so a DAO pretty much is a decentralized group of people who are able to coordinate and govern themselves on that decentralized layer, right? Um, so specifically in the case of, of blockchains, these DAOs are codified through smart contracts. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, codified in the sense of like a decentralized codified application, because obviously you could codify it and put it on a AWS server somewhere. And that's not necessarily a DAO anymore. It's a, a SAO, I guess, a centralized organization. So we're gonna be just talking about um, decentralized uh, codified organizations, right? So codified governance has some inherent risks and, and, and benefits that we need to understand before we can really jump into what's out there. So one of the first ones that's one of my favorite issues that um, DAOs suffer from is incentive design, right? If you design your incentives poorly, you're going to get poor outcomes, right? Which is the, the COBRA effect, right? Like poor designs lead to, poor incentive design lead to poor incentive outcomes. Um, the next major big baddie that comes out lots is hacks. Obviously the most famous DAO, the DAO, um, that was launched in, in, in 2016, got hacked almost as soon as it went live. Um, which actually caused the first hard fork in Ethereum, which led to Ethereum Classic, where the hack actually still happened, right? And obviously, hacks in the case of DAOs is quite horrible because, you know, the whole point of this DAO was decentralized coordination, and now you've got a hack that kind of cuts through all of that and does what it wants, um, irrespective of what your community wanted. Um, and the next major thing that I think isn't spoken about enough in, in the sense of DAOs is accessibility. A lot of these DAOs have terrible user experience, terrible user interfaces. It's not intuitive. It's not well just explained, um, which actually reduces the number of people who would even think to try play with DAOs because they're just, they're not really designed for the general public um, in terms of like user groups, right? And then the last big problem with codified governance is uh, execution power distribution. So what I mean by that is how the power to make decisions is distributed, right? A lot of these larger projects, for example, Compound, um, most of the governance tokens are owned by their early investors. So irrespective of what the community wants, those early investors can really decide um, to vote any way they want and no one else really has the power to stop them, um, which is not great. <laughs> so now we get to the, the, the benefits. Um, there's obviously quite a few, but I feel like these are the, the top ones. So the first one off the bat is censorship resistance um, because it's codified in a decentralized way. It means no central entity could take it down, um, even if they wanted to. Uh, Double-edged blade here. Uh, incentives are also a major pro of DAOs, because uh, obviously, if you do your incentives right, you can get like incredible benefits and like uh, aligning your community and, and making sure that everyone's on the same page, irrespective of, of not being geographically together. Um, 
but you've got to be careful with your incentive design because it can backfire really, really easily. Uh, and then the next one, major one is transparency. So obviously governance uh, and governments nowadays in the real world aren't necessarily very transparent. Um, and DAOs are transparent from the ground up, right? Every transaction, every movement of funds, every proposal is visible to the entire public, um, which is just incredible to, if, to think about it. Um, and it also prevents a lot of those shady under the table um, things from happening because everyone can see that it happened. Um, and then last but definitely not least is upgradability. So traditional governments struggle to stay up to date and be able to actually push out legislation fast enough to keep up with like what's happening in the world. Whereas DAOs most of the time, most of the time um, from the ground up are built to be extendable and interchangeable so that you can kind of keep your DAO evolving as your governance needs change. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the pros and cons of, of DAOs uh, as a whole. Um, and now this is just a quick, I will be very quick about this. You don't necessarily need to be very comfortable with all of these terms, but it will help if you just heard them at least once before we get into the, the individual um, frameworks. So we've got governance tokens. So um, if you're familiar with the uni token, the comp token, all of these tokens that are actually, uh, you know, you require them in order to be able to vote, those are governance tokens. Um, all of those tokens are liquid governance tokens, which means you can sell them on markets, right? Which means a lot of those governance protocols are vulnerable to flash loans and things like that. Um, but those are liquid governance tokens. And then you get the other flavor of governance tokens, which are illiquid governance tokens, which means they're non-transferable, um, which is mostly in the use of reputation. So, you know, your address accrues reputation, you can't transfer it, you can't sell it, you can't buy it, um, which is just a, a nice alignment tool. So we've got EOAs. So this is just an account where you own the private key, uh, multisigs, which is just a collection of wallets that then agree to execute on something together. Uh, a treasury. Treasury is just a tool that DAOs use in order to aggregate and manage funds. Um, super basic. And then L1 blockchain. I'm not going to get into too deep on this one because we could, we could do a whole talk on L1s versus L2s. But an L1 blockchain is pretty much just like a root blockchain. So like Ethereum or Bitcoin. An L2 blockchain is a blockchain that uses an L1 for security, but is like faster or cheaper or both. Um, so, you know, like on Ethereum, there's quite a few L2s, you know, Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, all of those. Bitcoin, there's Lightning Network. Um, so they're pretty much just blockchains that get their security from another blockchain, right? That's why they're the second layer. Right. Okay. <laughs> just, I can't see the chat, so I hope everyone's just uh, following along nicely. Right. So now we get to the actual things that make up a DAO right the, the guts it's 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 organs um so obviously right off the bat we have proposals you need to be able to propose a change to the DAO in order to have a governance and coordination mechanism um so then there's voting which is you know the ability to vote on a proposal um and then execution so this is something a lot of DAOs don't handle explicitly but um execution comes in two flavors it's on-chain and off-chain so if you have on-chain execution, it means that the proposal needs to be able to execute on-chain. So for example, I wanna send someone tokens, that needs to happen on-chain because the DAO is, has a treasury and you, know, you need to get that transaction to get the funds out of the treasury to a person. Right, so that's execution. And then off-chain execution, obviously you just agree to it on-chain, but you need to like do it off-chain. So this would be like community guidelines and that kind of stuff. Um, then we have the consensus. So this is how do we actually determine what makes a vote pass, right? Like what is a vote and, and what, what, what makes it pass? So normally in, in most DAOs, what makes a vote powerful is how many governance tokens you own. So it's not necessarily that you have a unique address, it's that you have a unique address with 10,000 uni. So you now have a vote weight of 10,000 uni. Right, most um, DAO protocols just use a, a liquid token for this. So just their tradable, buyable governance token. Um, so then we have voters. So, you know, just cover that. It's not necessarily an address that's a voter, although, you know, obviously the vote needs to come from an address. It's actually how many tokens they own that represents their, their like power in a vote. So then we have consensus mechanisms. Um, this one's just a fun one uh, is, is holographic consensus. A holographic voting. So um, normally you just require a simple majority, right? So just 
50% of the token supply votes yes. Great, that vote's gonna pass. With a holographic consensus, what you do is that if only 20% of all the tokens in existence vote on this proposal, then you only need a majority of that 20%. So you don't need a majority of the entire DAO, everyone who owns this token, you only need a majority of the people who actually participated in the governance. And this is just to kind of reduce gridlocks and, you know, oh, we need 10,000 people to vote now because all the tokens are really well distributed, you know, and, and then you get those like bureaucratic gridlocks where you can't actually move forward because um, not enough people are voting. Um, then last, but definitely not least, actually it's not last at all, um, is prediction markets. So this is, you can think of as like a glorified betting market where you can bet whether you think a proposal is going to pass or not. Um, and these just allow for a secondary uh, layers of, of consensus where, you know, you have a proposal, only a few people are actually going to actively vote on this proposal. But if you have a prediction market behind it saying, you know, like most people have put money, which is why I say bet, right, money behind this proposal saying, I think this proposal is going to pass, you probably got a good idea of how many people would vote for it. Um, and it's often, you know, it, it can be used in place of actual voting. Um, right, I promise this is the last bit of terminology and then we'll get into the, the different use cases. So boosted proposals, these are where someone has put money behind a proposal because they want it to get voted on quicker. Um, so, you know, I, I propose that I want to get paid for this month's work. So I would boost that proposal so that more people see it um, and then vote on it, right? So you can think of it as like a promoted tweet, you know, like ads that pop up at the top of the list. Um, if that's, that's pretty much what it is, actually. They just, they just don't phrase it like that, but that's what it is. Um, so then we have a dynamic threshold. So this is just something to control boosted proposals, right? Because if everyone just boosts all the proposals, then it doesn't actually help make the list more curated because all the proposals are boosted. So what a dynamic threshold just means is every for every proposal that gets boosted, you have to pay more and more to boost the proposal just to prevent you know, lots of people spamming it all at once. Um, so it's a, a bonding curve for proposal um, boosting. So then our last two things is financial community engagement, which is um, if someone puts money into the protocol, they often get rewarded either in governance tokens or liquidity providing tokens. And that's, you know, non, that's financial community engagement. They financially engaged with the protocol and they got rewarded for it. And then we have non-financial community engagement, um, which is often not catered for in a lot of DAOs, which is things like, you know, onboarding new members into the DAO, discussing, you know, being active on the, on the Discord or the Discourse um, app. Uh, it's, it's like all the, all the soft skills that aren't directly related to finances, but these can be just as important as the financial contributions. Uh, so it's really important to, to consider these uh, when choosing a, a DAO framework. So who we are covering, we're going to go over Elastic DAO, DAO Stack, Colony, Moloch DAO V2, which is pretty much just DAO house. And then very briefly, we'll look at Aragon if we have time. Um, right, so Elastic DAO. So Elastic DAO is an L1 DAO, so they're built on the Ethereum main chain. Uh, they have an Elastic Supply token, which just means that um, their token, your token balance rebases. So every time someone new enters the DAO, right, they put more money into the DAO, and uh, everyone's token balances go up, so that you don't actually dilute previous members, right? If you're familiar at all with, um, uh, you know, shares and, and like equity in normal companies. If um, you want to add a new investor in, but you don't necessarily want to dilute everyone else's voting power, you just make everyone have more shares, right? Um, so that's what, like a very <laughs> brief and, and non-technical explanation of, of rebasing. Um, right, and then with Elastic DAO, um, in order to fund community developments, they actually pull funds directly out of the treasury. So when you join, you pay ETH and you get some tokens back. Great, now you're part of the DAO. Um, and then for the DAO to pay for developments, they actually take those funds directly out of that deposit contract, which effectively lowers the value of all the tokens, but you still have more tokens. Um, they limit the voting power for address per address, which is quite nice. So one address can only have a thousand um, Elastic DAO tokens worth of voting power, right? Which is nice, except, you know, you could very easily just make a second wallet and send it the rest of your tokens so that you can have, you know, all your tokens actively voting. Um, 
And then something that ElasticDAO does is they don't have on-chain, well, they originally had on-chain governance, their V1 had on-chain execution. Um, and then the price of voting got too expensive with the recent gas price hikes on Ethereum mainnet. So they actually removed this. And now there is a multi-sig that the uh, ElasticDAO um, founders run. So it's their wallets on that multi-sig. Um, and then they do voting through Snapchat, which is like an off-chain tool. Um, and then they will actually execute that vote on chain. So it's not actually properly decentralized because there's this multi-sig that actually has the power to execute. And while they do follow what the community votes for, there's nothing actually forcing them to follow what the community votes for. So um, that's something to keep in mind, especially um, with L2s and all that kind of stuff is who actually has the execution power because a lot of the time, it is sadly a multi-sig that you know some people own privately in the in the back that actually does the, the execution. So the next DAO is DAO Stack. Um, they've been around quite a while. So they are on L1 and on XDAI. XDAI is an L2 chain. Um, they use boosted holographic consensus for proposals. This is what we talked about earlier, where you put money behind a proposal and then it gets like boosted to the top of the list. And then if it has been boosted, you only need to get a holographic consensus being you know, a majority of the people who vote on that proposal rather than a majority of all the people who can vote, right? Um, they use prediction markets to improve voter attention. So as well as being able to boost a proposal, people can bet on whether or not they think a proposal is going to pass. And then they rank the proposals according to those bets. And then that's the list that you see when you go onto like the view proposals page is this page ordered by these bets, um, which obviously could be taken advantage of. You know, you could just um, put money behind a whole bunch of proposals so that another good proposal gets buried. So, you know, you always have to be very conscious about the, the incentives here. They allow for extensions and like external plugins, uh, which is quite nice. Um, and they have pre-built incentives that you can uh, choose from, but it limits flexibility because you can't actually like specify. So for example, uh, you can reward a successful proposal. So if someone proposes something and it gets voted in, you reward them, but it doesn't actually let you say how much they're going to get rewarded from. You just, it just says reward them. So you don't actually have very granular control over those incentives. They just have, you know, they've done the modeling and they're just like, you trust us, this is the, the way to do it. Um, so they have a few um, uh, incentives you can you can choose from. So you can turn all of these on or off, um, which is nice because you don't have to do any of the, the hard thinking behind incentive design then. So the next uh, DAO proposal project we're gonna look at is, is Colony. Um, so they've actually been around for years, but they only recently launched their um, first version and now their second version. So they're designed for L1 um, and they do try to reduce the amount of voting that needs to happen on chain because with current gas prices, it's quite expensive. Um, so they have multiple, um, they call them like power setups. So you can go from a dictatorship where, you know, one address has all the power and everyone else is just pretty much there to like watch what happens all the way to decentralized groups. However, if you choose to start with a, uh, like centralized group, right? Like a dictatorship, you can't then later down the line change that to a decentralized group. Um, so you, you kind of need to make sure it's the right one for the long haul. Um, they have reputation as well within the system and their reputation decays. So if you don't use it and you're not actively voting, your reputation will decay and will eventually go to zero, uh, which is a nice incentive to you know keep people active in the communities. Another thing they do that's different from other DAOs is um, the, the idea of teams. So it's pretty much sub DAOs is, is how you could think of it. But these teams within the groups can then have a leader. So someone who has execution power and they have their own treasuries so they can be allocated funds from the main DAO and then go and autonomously execute on um, what the team is meant to do. Um, they also have, in my opinion, obviously it's a little bit subjective, um, they have a great user experience like their app is is, is quite nice to, like designed and it looks good um which takes us to Moloch, who um originally had one of the worst user uh experiences again in my opinion um because all of this stuff is demon themed and i don't know why 
I don't know why they thought that would be a good theme. Like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so they've actually recently launched um, like their V2, which is DAO house, which you can see this colorful group of squares underneath their demonic logo is a DAO house. So um, this is actually about DAO house, which is Moloch's V2 rebranding because I feel like they realized it wasn't the best branding decisions. So um, there's actually quite a few like different spin-offs from Moloch. So there's um, DAO house and democracy earth. So the, they take the same framework that DAO house was built on and just kind of make it a bit more open and easy to, to actually launch your own DAO with because Moloch DAO was originally launched as a product, not as a DAO framework. Um, so yeah, D Moloch itself is actually mostly used for investment and grant work. Um, but their actual t contract ecosystem was so nice that people spun it off to its own DAO framework, thus DAO house. So it's got a very extendable design. It's got a two token system, which is quite nice. So it has its um, liquid uh, governance token being the, sh the, the, the share token. Uh, and they have a loot token, which is your claim to the treasury, right? So if um, you buy some loot tokens, it means you now have uh, rights to, to claim some money out of the treasury should you wish to. And then the shares are solely voting power. Uh, and then the DAO house ecosystem has a meta DAO, uh, a meta DAO just being a DAO that controls the ecosystem uh, called Uber house, which is pretty much, they just, you know, they manage um, deploying new versions, keeping code up to date. You know, um, if you request features, they'll build it for you, that kind of stuff, right? They're just maintaining the system pretty much. Um, so yeah, they, they're, they're really nice. Uh, the two token system here is great. Uh, it's actually quite a clever little design that they've got going on there with the, the two tokens. Um, because you can give up your governance power, your shares, without giving up your claim to the treasury, which is pretty neat. And then last but not least, we have Aragon. So um, Aragon has been around for ages. Um, they're currently only on L1, but they have big plans to launch on, I think, Polygon um, uh, pretty soon. So they have all the, the basic DAO functionality. They were one of the, the earlier DAOs out there. Um, they have one governance token called um, ANT. Uh, and they also have a very clever, what makes them unique from other DAO systems is they have a dispute resolution. They have Aragon courts which allows you to do dispute resolution, right? So um, if, you know, say we have a small little DAO and I want to withdraw, you know, half the funds, um, but you think obviously, no, you can't just take half the funds. So you put in a dispute. Then what will happen is Aragon will assign us a jury, which is three individuals who have staked their ANT tokens. Uh, and they will, you know, come as, you know, they're people, they're not bots or anything like that. Um, you know, understand the situation, figure out what's going on, and then they will decide whether or not they think um, the dispute is correct. So obviously in this case, the dispute was correct. I shouldn't be taking half the money. So they all vote to, you know, that to overthrow the decision. So I can't withdraw my funds um, and the DAO goes on. So it, it's a nice way of, of having an external moderator for DAO debates that get a bit too heated, um, which often other protocols don't really handle you, they just expect you to handle those within your own um, ecosystem. It does come at the cost though of, um, they make their money, the Aragon team makes their money through the, the Aragon court system. So it does mean that a lot of the time in the front end, they're kind of pushing you towards disputing because that's how they make revenue. So always got to think about those incentive designs. Right, so in summary, like if you're going to choose a DAO framework, you need to understand what your requirements are, right? So how big is your community? Uh, what coordination tools are you using right now? Are you using Discord? Great. Some DAOs actually have support for Discord. If Are you using, you know, Telegram? You're going to be in a bit more trouble. Um, if you have a pre-existing token, not all DAO frameworks actually support um, pre-existing tokens. All of the ones we discussed today do. So if you already have an ERC20, that's your governance token, you could plug it into the DAO, but some of the newer DAOs um, and some of the way older DAOs don't actually support um, pre-existing tokens. You have to deploy a token with the Colony V1. You couldn't um, use a pre-existing token. You had to deploy a new token. Uh, and then where are you on the decentralized to decentralized scale? You know, are you a small early team of like five or six people or three or four people? Or are you, you know, a community of three or 400 and you actually need the facilities for proper decentralized governance? Or could you just get away with a, a multi-sig? 
Um, and then what, what do you need out of your DAO? Like, do you need flexibility or do you need security? You know, those two are often at the other opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, how much risk can your community handle? You know, could you take a bet on trying a newer, more innovative DAO framework at the risk of getting your governance hacked? Um, you know, how much, how much on-chain value are you actually putting at risk here? Um, and then incentives, of course, you know, like, are you, do you just want to incentivize financial uh, activity within your DAO? Or do you want to incentivize non-financial activity as well? Um, you know, in a lot of DAOs right now, especially DeFi projects that launch their own DAOs, like Compound, are they Uniswap? They only uh, incentivize financial contributions, which has resulted in their discords being quite chaotic and, you know, like lots of win moons. Um, like, you know, so it kind of disaligns the, the community. Whereas if you incentivize non-financial engagement, like, um, you know, being active on the discord, poking lots and that kind of stuff, you can kind of prevent a lot of that community culture degradation, right? Into just DeFi degenerates. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that was that was my uh, lovely little spiel about um, the DAO infrastructure right now. I have a massive list of sources. If you want this, please just uh, uh, let me know and I will definitely um, distribute it. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's see what's on your mind, guys. Like, Thank you, Veronica. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. We definitely have some questions uh, popping into the chat see can someone with a majority of tokens bias the vote um where is the transparency on the weighting right that's a great question so as i said most DAOs, what they do is that uh, it's one governance token one vote weight right um but but some some protocols have say for example a two token system where they've got reputation and tokens and then there's like a multiplier between them uh, and actually, some of those processes can be quite difficult to, to, to discover and to find out and to actually be like, to actually know where to look to find out if how that, that weighting is, is distributed. But most of the time, it's a very safe assumption that it's uh, weighted solely from the governance tokens. Um, so, you know, if I have an address with 10,000 governance tokens, or if I have 10,000 addresses with one governance token, and we all voted on one thing, it would still, it would, both of those would have exactly equal weightings. Um, yeah, do you ever lose money from a certain outcome of a vote? Also a good question. So that depends on the DAO framework. Some DAO frameworks don't disincentivize you voting wrong. So let me just say that again, right? They don't disincentivize you from voting wrong. So they do incentivize you to vote right. So if you vote right, you get a reward. And if you vote right, wrong, you get punished, right? You get some tokens taken away from you. Most DAO frameworks don't actually disincentivize people from voting because they already have so few people voting that to disincentivize it would be to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, I, I think MakerDAO in its early days only had like 3% of all token holders voting or, or of all tokens in circulation voting. And that's considering that the team had a lot of those tokens. So you, you definitely, um, you don't wanna disincentivize it. Some protocols do, you like, depending on the protocol, you will need to do your research. Um, a lot of what protocols about? do, yeah. What about for the, I was the one that asked that question. What about for the predictive markets? Um, I like, cause you said, you mentioned betting on it and I was like, okay, so if you can bet on it, you probably, is there a reward for betting right? Is there, um, cause I think you're, what you're talking about now is like making the actual vote, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, with prediction markets, you're hundred percent spot on. It's gambling. No, it's not, it's betting. So um, if you bet for a proposal, and that proposal fails, they take your money, right? Because it's betting. So, so the, the people who voted against it, their funds go to the people who correctly voted for it. So yeah, if in prediction markets, you can very easily lose your funds. Um, but on the actual voting, most, most dials won't, won't disincentivize you. And are the uh, prediction, prediction, are the prediction yeah. markets like third party or are they a part of the DAO itself? Or is it like, like any prediction market can vote on any voter on any DAO? So there are a few prediction market um, systems that are completely separate from the DAOs. Uh, but most of the time, if the DAO is going to take that prediction market into account, right? So if, if they're going to actually let that prediction market have weight on whether or not a vote should be boosted or that kind of stuff, um, they'll run their own prediction market 
internally, or I guess not internally, but for their own community. So to be a separate um, entity, but still connected. Uh, but there are quite a few prediction markets that are completely separate, like completely separate, where it's just two people betting against or for a proposal completely separately from the DAO, often without the DAO's knowledge. Um, but yeah, I think Gnosis is actually doing quite a bit towards making like a universal prediction market platform where then all the DAOs can have one place where their proposals are being voted for or against, well, bet for or against. Um, but yeah, good Thank distinction. You. Uh, do you know of any DAOs with clever spins on identity? Um, yes, so um, the Lao is a DAO, <laughs> it's the L-A-O, Lao. Um, so they're a DAO, they're an investment DAO. Um, they have a legal framework behind them. So it's not an open DAO. So you can't just join the DAO. You have to go through a KYC process. So um, that's kind of the trade-off with, with, with having identity solutions attached to DAOs is it's kind of an all or nothing. You either have it completely open and there's no way to verify anyone or you have it completely closed and you have a very rigid way of verifying everyone. That's, that's normally the trade-off. You could do both where you have individuals who have been KYC'd and then they have like an extra badge or something, but I don't actually know of any system that does accommodate both. Um, so, so yeah, they, there's a lot of clever people trying to solve the identity problem on chain. Um, but obviously, you know, everything you put on chain is public. So if you put your, you know, government issued ID number on chain, you're going to get, you know, identity theft. So <laughs> it's, it's a very, it's a very, um, tricky problem that that a lot of clever people are trying to to fix right now um who will lead projects in a DAO are they all volunteers that is a fantastic question so often in DAOs they incentivize people to, to participate by giving them governance tokens so you come do a bit of work for the DAO and you'll get governance tokens but often in the beginning it starts with either just the core team or a core group of volunteers who have decided that, you know, they really want to support this DAO and they really want to take it somewhere. Uh, it's only actually later in a DAO's life cycle when they have, it has more people and a decent sized treasury that it can actually support um, those people financially and actually pay you for your contribution and time. A, a great example of a DAO that has this down pat right now is DX DAO. They have a workers fund where you can get compensated some pretty like, market um, competitive rates for doing work on the DAO. But this normally only happens later in the stage in the DAO's, DAO's life cycle when it actually has the funds to, to pay for people to, to work full time. So yeah, the, the short answer is it's volunteers for the first part. Uh, volunteers either being founders or like just crazy crypto people who are genuinely volunteering their time. Um, can you show the sources? I will share the sources now now. Um, actually, I can just share them now. Um, okay. At what level is the DAO system operated, e.g. retailer space versus corporate versus institution? That's a great question because they're kind of everything. Um, they kind of exist in all of those spaces. Um, you know, some DAOs are like like the Lao, for example, it's much more on the institutional investment organizing that just so happens to have its organization tool be on chain, all the way to completely, you know, real out there ones like Gitcoin, for example, which is one of my favorite projects, um, where you can actually go and, and, and just support random projects. And like, there's, there's no structure, really, it's kind of much more free for all. Um, so a DAO really can accommodate all of it like it can it can be um just it covers that whole range it's it's retail it's corporate it's I've, I've heard of a few major um clothing brands actually funny enough like doing DAOs and stuff like there's there's lots of people interested in decentralized governance and decentralized um organizations although some of them it's less about the decentralized and more about the online coordination um obviously the uh pandemic has done a great number to, to, to companies having to go uh, work in remote ways and they need new coordination tools and DAOs actually might just uh, fill that gap, which would be fantastic for everyone involved. Um, okay. 
Do you know any good tools to incentivize non-financial activity? Oh, yes, I do. There's a great project called SourceCred. Um, what they're doing is literally that is, is non-financial incentivization. So what they do is they plug into your Discord, your GitHub, your whatever you want to track community engagement on and then distribute these, um, I think they call them kernel or something, some, some pun around crops um, coin that is actually a reputation token that kind of represents that, oh, you know, you've been engaging lots on the Discord, you've been engaging lots on the GitHub, here's your reward. And then you can uh, integrate that into your DAO so that those reputation tokens have weight, although not all DAOs actually support you adding a token like that where it's non-transferable and that kind of stuff. Um, what was the yeah, name of so, the DAO? Uh, it's, it's called source cred. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and, and they're great. But I mean, for example, Colony, Colony does uh, incentivization as well. They do reputation stuff as well, but it's more related to how you work for the DAO and that kind of stuff rather than like completely separate stuff. And then how that DAO, the, the, the reputation actually gets distributed is they add like a bot to your GitHub or your Discord or your thing that's actually tracking messages people send and then is distributing it according to that. Because obviously it's off chain. There's no way to check that on chain. So it, it, they use um, clever little bots that go through everything. Um, could you please go through what a DAO is again? I'm still grappling with this concept. What is the design? What are they designed to achieve? Can you actually limit centralized power while still preserving the ability to change and grow? Damn, that's deep on. Okay. so. The concept of a DAO is an organization that is not geographically bound or geographically anything, right? It's decentralized. But more than just being decentralized in, in location, it's also decentralized in the fact that it's running on a decentralized blockchain. So it gets all the benefits of blockchain, like censorship resistance and transparency, right? Um, the, the design, what, what we're trying to achieve by making a DAO is allowing groups of individuals to coordinate despite not being near each other or not physically knowing each other a lot of the time um, and coordinate in a way where they can actually get a lot of things done and, and, and move forward and, and progress on an organization or an idea without having you know, to incorporate a legal entity or spend thousands of dollars on lawyer fees incorporating as a legal entity. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it, you can think of it as like the next step in governance and um, organization of human beings in general, because, uh, and yeah, and then um, most of these DAOs are designed to be able to be upgradable and change how it works as they grow so that you can have this kind of organic growth that often um, corporate structures lack, you know, like as soon as they get past a certain scale, boop, you now get shoehold into doing one job forever. Whereas DAOs, you know, as they kind of expand, they can create sub DAOs that still have that autonomy and that like creative engagement in their work to, to, to keep the people on the end of the day actually engaged in what they're doing. Um, that being said, DAOs are still in a very, very early stage, um, you know, and, and they're not super wide adopted and they've still got lots of bugs to figure out and there's still lots of like incentive design we need to get sorted. So it's still, it's still in its infancy as a, as a concept. Um, with, <laughs> with your level of knowledge, what drives you to give these talks? The short answer is that um, there's just really not a lot of resources out there. And when I first joined the space, you know, I would Google a problem and uh, Google would be like, there are no search results for your, for your query. And I just sit there like, what must I do now? You know, I have a bug, there's no, there's no resources. So, you know, it, it, that's what really drove me to, I've written a lot of articles as well, um, more on the technical stuff than the like um, non-technical explanations. And um, yeah, like it just, they just, we just need more people making resources because there's just, there's so much information and yet not enough people actually putting in the time to share that info with the rest of people. Um, I will tell you a funny story though. I hate, absolutely hate, drives me nuts. If I have a problem and I Google it and my article is the top response because I know what's in the article and uh, that's not what I needed. Um, and that happens more than I would like to, to know. Like, yeah, so if, if you get to that point where you know something, teach because the best time to teach it is when you've just learned it because that's when you know how to explain it because you understand where all the difficulties were. Um, at this point, I'm like, what are people going to struggle with? 
right, pull that together quick. Um, yeah, this is a networking question. Are there anybody else working in the DAOs for the domestic energy sector in the UK? That's very interesting. I'll let the chat answer that if there is anyone. Um, yeah. Is there a directory or website for people to track all the DAOs and their projects? No, but that is a great idea for a hackathon. Um, there might be one, I just don't know if one. So <laughs> uh, someone would need to, to, to dig into that. Um, what resources do you recommend for someone just in the space? So, wow. Um, <laughs> the space is very big and scary and there's a lot of nonsense out there. So if you're new to the space, what I recommend is just learning from as many different sources as you can, because you'll start to see, oh, okay, all, everyone kind of agrees that this is how it works. And you'll be able to kind of get enough knowledge to sniff out when people are talking nonsense in articles, because it happens way more than I'd like to, to see, especially, oh my God, especially with mainstream media outlets, they write articles and I'm like, who was your expert? Who did you consult on this? This is not how that works. You know, and like, yeah, so I would stay away from mainstream. Um, if you're a developer, it's a bit easier. You know, I would go say like, go read um, the Solidity docs and like go do like the Crypto Zombies tutorial. But on the non-technical side, the resources are much more sparse and much more um, think tank kind of feel which can kind of take away from the learning of it because they're often trying to shill their product on you while they're, while they're talking. Um, what planet are you from? <laughs> I'm from Earth, South Africa, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here and share this all with you. Um, yeah, I'm also on three coffees, so I'm quite energetic right now. So I apologize if it's, if it's too much. Um, but yeah, so if you're if you're trying to learn more, I would just I would just honestly just read as much as you can. Um, Medium's a good place to start. There's also uh, Mirror.xyz. They're like a decentralized version of um, of Medium. Uh, and there's another one that Aragon. If you go onto the Aragon Medium, they just announced um, a while ago that they were like, oh, we're not going to post on Medium anymore because it's so centralized and like we're against censorship. So they link to another also decentralized um, like blog platform. But I will warn you that uh, those other platforms can get quite technical quite quickly. So just keep your eyes peeled. Um, I mean, even if they get technical, just skim it. Like I skim the math when I read white papers. You don't, you don't need to read that to like grasp the whole concept. Um, top three projects underway. Are these DAO projects or just projects in general? Paul. You pick. Okay, so my top three DAO projects, obviously my first top DAO project would have to be the DAO that I'm busy building right now. So um, uh, there's my there's my shill for the day's talk. I'm building a project called uh, Devolution. There is no website, don't try Google it. Um, but um, yeah, so we're, we're building a like a very flexible um, DAO framework that kind of allows you to do extendability in a lot of ways that the current DAO systems don't let you uh, do. Um, but yeah, then after that would definitely be source cred. They're like a, uh, they've got a soft spot in my heart. Like I love them. They're, they're a very clever project and a clever team doing some, some really cool stuff, especially because it's not on the finances side, which is often the side of crypto that's the kind of neglected is, is the, because right now DeFi is having its, its moment. Um, and then probably after that would be Uniswap because I just love their whole vibe and their energy and like how sassy everyone is on Twitter. Um, and those, those would be my, my top three. Um, oh, that's another great reading, uh, learning resource is to just go follow crypto Twitter lists. Um, you, you, like you read a lot of interesting threads and like meet a lot of cool people. And often, you know, like a lot of these people are really open. Like you can DM them and they'll answer your questions. Like it's a very, it's a very giving and open space, you know, like it's open source through and through. So, um, yeah, you can also like follow me on Twitter if you have any questions later. I'm always, <laughs> always excited to, to talk about this stuff. Um, I read a lot of academic papers on blockchain, including DAOs. Nice. Do you have a view about academics stacked up about ooh, academic papers stacked up against experience at the coal face? I'm not sure what the coal face is. If you could define that, I can uh, give you my <laughs> opinion. Um, 
Doug, do you wanna you wanna hop on? Um, At the call face, um, this is Larry. Just normally means literally working with your hands on um, a project. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so I find academic papers can be very interesting around DAOs. Thank you, Larry, for that, by the way. Um, you know, the, the academic papers, they often look at it from a much higher level. You know, they're looking at it in terms of like, what would its global impact be? Or like, how does it work? Or what are its vulnerabilities? Or like, how are we incentive designing and that kind of stuff? But I often find they tend to um, miss out on like what actually happens when you, when you release something into the wild. You know, it's like um, my favorite is is a lot of people who invest in traditional markets when they come into DeFi, they're like, oh, it's so illogical. No one like no one cares about the news or anything. The price just does its own thing. Um, and like DAOs are no different. You know, you do all this game theoretical incentive design, um, but it's just that it's just theory. And often in implementation, it looks quite different and it turns out quite differently. Um, but I think the academic papers do do a lot on the like um you know like getting to the to the root of things you know they'll often like nail down on one issue and like get to the bottom of it like why is this an issue or why does this work or why is this a vulnerability uh, which i really appreciate because it doesn't happen enough um uh, especially after big hacks and that kind of stuff uh what is my take on nfts are there any nft projects on DAOs which intrigue you so I, <laughs> I love NFTs. I find it such a pity that we're only really looking at their use case in art because they have such an incredible application outside of art. Um, I actually did a talk earlier this year about using NFTs for like vaccine tracking and being able to like verify a vaccine from, you know, from the factory it left all the way up until you get jabbed in the arm. Um, you know, so it's like, I, I'm quite a fan of NFTs. Uh, although the use case is quite limited right now. In terms of DAOs that are using NFTs, I actually don't know of any DAOs right now um, that are actively minting NFTs, for example. Um, a lot of the DAO frameworks that we discussed today actually don't support NFTs. They don't support 721. So you couldn't send them an NFT, they would lose it, um, which is sad, but um, they're trying to catch up. Uh, although I'm, I'm sure there's some like early art groups that are, are trying to, to create a DAO for their, for their NFTs. Um, I, I, hi, Veronica. I, I read about this uh, Pleaser DAO, who, which actually they buy uh, NFT and they allow people to invest in NFTs through this DAO. Oh, oh, so like fractionalized ownership. Though that's quite a cool use case for a DAO with NFTs, right? So the NFT owns the DAO, and then you can own tokens of the DAO, and then that like yeah. equates to fractionalized ownership of the NFT, which is a nice way to like refungibilize, if that's a word, the the non fungible token. Um, but there's there's yeah, a and, lot of projects out there. Like <laughs> it's a they um, they I think they recently um, bought this uh, Doge Doge coin. Um, the 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 photo of the the, the picture of that dog, yeah. um, and then and it was uh sold for quite well they they bought it for quite a, uh a few million dollars. People spend a fool and their money will soon be parted, and I have very <laughs> little sympathy for people who buy Dogecoin. You're playing games as long as you're as long as you know that it's all good. Um, how did you first get into the space? Um, right, so I actually first got into the space by doing the Consensus Academy Bootcamp. I think it's a six week uh, bootcamp, it's like 15 hours a week of uh, coding requirements or like time requirements. And it, it teaches you how to write Solidity. That's where I started. It was a great starting block because while they do focus on the code a decent amount, the first two quarters of it uh, or three, three quarters of it actually just focus on theory and like understanding what a blockchain is, which I find a lot of the online courses, you know, like the ones on Coursera or on YouTube kind of, they jump straight into the code without actually teaching you like what your code is executing on because it's a completely different paradigm. It's not like learning a new coding language, you know, like JavaScript versus TypeScript. It's a whole different execution environment. Um, 
so yeah, if, if you want to get into the space, I would recommend starting with, with understanding the, um, the, the system itself, right? Like what is a blockchain? Where is your code running? How is it running? What kind of limitations are there? Because, oh my God, there are some, there are a lot of limitations. So, you know, like understanding that base layer and then understanding how to code the languages um, on any blockchain, uh, I would recommend going that way around. Uh, and there's a lot of career opportunities in this space right now. They, the space is desperate for developers. You don't even need to be that qualified. You can, you can be new and like, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity um, in the space, especially if you're on the um, blockchain, either as a smart contract developer or an integration specialist, um, like those are, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Um, could you see the DAO system used for voting even in a government party? Oh my God, yes. In like 10 years, give them time to catch up. But um, I, I don't see a world in which DAOs don't end up being used in traditional governments because they just bring so much transparency. <laughs> Although, you know, it might be more transparency than necessarily the politicians want. So there might be resistance on their side to that. Um, which, yeah, yeah, that's a, a real problem. So, yeah, but I, I genuinely think there is no world in which we don't eventually end up with some kind of DAO system running in governments because it just, um, I live in South Africa, we have a lot of corruption. And if there was an open framework where I could see where my government was spending my money, it would be a very different country. So, um, yes, definitely, I see, I see DAOs going into governments. Uh, what can a junior Solidity dev expect to get paid? So payment really depends on who you work for. If you go work for a DAO, for example, like DXDAO, like I mentioned, right? So they have, um, you get compensated hourly depending on how much experience you have. I think the lowest tier was like, uh, I think for the for lowest technical tier, um, DXDAO worker co-op, sorry, worker. Um, and I'll send the link in the in the chat, just so everyone can have a quick squiz, because it's very interesting. Um, uh, oh, here it is. Lovely. Yeah. So um, I think their top tier is eight thousand US dollars a month for full time work, and their bottom technical tier is like. 2000 or something um but that being said they also give you like um governance tokens that vest so it actually works out to quite a bit more depending on how much the governance tokens worth but i mean that's just working for a dao right that's not even like a normal job um but like the the, the range for uh, a mid-level solidity developer is between like 80 and 150 for seniors like 100 to 200 uh for junior you're probably looking at like between 50 and 80k us uh, annual um, but yeah, it really depends on, on who you're working for, where they are geographically, what the project's working on, and if there's tokens, because um, some projects, you know, you can actually just get tokens instead of payment, and uh, it might work out better like that, depending on the project. So, um, but if, when you're just starting, I wouldn't recommend accepting tokens for in lieu of payment, because you, you probably don't know enough to actually vet the project, and uh, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot there. Blockchain is a very used for voting in Estonia and Singapore. Yes, Estonia is one of my favorite, uh, like my favorite countries right now. They have been doing voting on the blockchain since 2015, their own blockchain that they built in 2012. Uh, they've been doing digital voting since 2007, I think. Like they are well ahead of the curve. Uh, that being said, Estonia and Singapore have very small populations. So for them to roll out this kind of infrastructure is much easier and there's a lot less resistance because I think Estonia's population is like less than 2 million people, you know, so like them rolling out a technological solution is only to 2 million people. It's not like America where it's like 300 million or China where it's lots or India where it's even more. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, if someone wants to become a blockchain product manager instead of a developer, are there opportunities out there? Yes, just uh, hold on. All right. I will, I will um, send you some links right now that will answer all of your questions. So there are a few um, blockchain 
websites that are just for jobs. So there's like crypto job list, like there's, there's a lot of them and I'll send you some now. And you can literally just go peruse these for opportunities. Um, if you want to be a crypto project manager, it definitely would help if you have done normal project management. You know, any pre-existing skills will set you up in, in the right direction. Because um, obviously they don't want to take someone who's new to everything. Like if this is your first job, yeah, you, you're going to join as a junior. Okay, like uh, no, no guarantees there. Um, but if you already have experience as a project manager, it'll be relatively easy to break into the, the crypto market. You just need to do a little bit of like, research and go understand how blockchain works at the very least um yeah anybody else have any questions for veronica yeah i was uh, when you're talking about the the pay um since DAOs are decentralized i'm guessing the pay is coming from the core team, which is, is kind of ironic because it could also come from the decentralized organization. I know Austin Griffiths, um, he built that Biddle, Biddle, Giddle, like buildgale.com and uh, the devs there can, uh, are funded by the community. But I was just wondering, I guess from like a salary perspective, what you're talking about, uh, the pay would probably be coming from the core team, right? So, so often the pay Okay. Um, the pay is either that you are not getting paid and you are just volunteering your time and services to this organization or alternatively, which does happen lots is that um, the treasury, like the DAO's treasury would actually pay you. So that would be, um, you know, taking money out of the treasury. So uh, oftentimes that means lowering the value of the token, right? Like the system token. Um, and then using that, that money to actually pay um, for the developers to do their thing. Um, so, so yeah, normally the funds come out of the treasury or they just mint new governance tokens. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's normally, the funds are coming out of somewhere um, and it's normally the treasury. Although in early stages, I guess it does sometimes happen that the original team will actually um, just fund everything. Great. Uh, yeah, here is the link for the sources, by the way. I just checked it in a Google Doc. Let me know if you have access um, or, you know, any of that weird stuff. I think the, um, the sources slide will show up in the recording anyhow um, that we'll put it online um, in the next 48 hours or so. Yeah, otherwise that's a source page. I see lots of people on it, so I assume it's working. Um, yeah, it's working, thanks. Great, yeah. So it's just uh, all the links for the various um, research I did for this um, and also just backing myself up with the, the right docs. Right, anybody else? Well, on that basis, I'm going to thank Veronica very much coming to us from South Africa. Um, and um, uh, we really appreciate. Um, and I certainly learned a whole lot, I have to say. Um, and um, we uh, thank you very much. And um, all of you, we look forward to seeing you and anybody you know next month. Um, we'll be posting the details of the next. Um, the July meeting uh, shortly. And um, thanks again for your time, everybody. Thank you, Veronica, that was brilliant. And guys, if you wanna carry on the discussion, you can always join our Telegram group. I can pop the link to it in the chat and join us there. And we'll see you next month. Thanks, Larry. Brilliant, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thanks again, Veronica. Veronica. Thank you. Absolute pleasure.